Hey, let's face it. Heads up drag racing's cool, but it takes deep pockets to be a serious competitor. Even deeper pockets when you break a lot of parts. That's why for weekend competitors, bracket racing is still the most popular class at the drag strip. So today on Horsepower, we're going to take a bunch of repurposed parts, a few new ones, and a whole lot of massaging, and build a budget bracket race engine that makes plenty of competitive, consistent power. Now, when building a race engine, especially, the parts are important, but it's the way you prep them and clearance them that really counts. Of course, since Chevy made over 90 million of these Chevy small blocks since 1955, this was a no-brainer for our base. It's been clearance for a stroker crank, Ward 30 over. Then John line the four bolt mains because we replaced the bolts for studs. The freeze and oil galley plugs are all new as well. Now, I also milled this block while I was at the machine shop, and I did that for a couple of reasons. One was to ensure flatness and squareness from top to bottom and front to back. Another one was to make sure that I had a nice smooth surface for my head gasket seal, as well as set my piston five thousandths in the hole. Now, I also upgraded from the stock type cam bearing to a Teflon coated from Durabon, and here's why. We're upgrading the camshaft to this. It's a hydraulic roller design from Comp Cams that not only sounds great, but should give us the gains we're looking for in mid to high RPM ranges without sacrificing our bottom end. It has a gross lift of 533 on the intake side and 519 on the exhaust with a 1-5 ratio rocker arm. The duration measures out at 243 on the intake side and 257 on the exhaust side at 50 thousandths valve lift. I like to put on the cam gear now and move it to the installed position. I'll show you why here in a minute. The next step is to install our main bearings. They're a three-quarter groove, high-performance bearing from King. Now, even though I lined home the block, there can be a small variance in size between bearing thickness as well as crank journals from when it was ground. So sometimes there's a slight difference in clearance between journals. It's not a big deal. All you have to do is know how to correct it. Without the crankshaft, all the caps and bearings need to be in place and torqued to spec. Then one by one, get a reading of your inside bearing diameter and write them down. Now, mic your crankshaft and get the outside diameter of each journal and write those down as well. Okay, let's take a look at our main bearing clearances. We're shooting for between two and three thousandths. Number two and three are set at two four, spot on. Now number one's a little on the small side at two thousandths even. Number four is a little on the big side at 2.7. Now here's how we're going to correct that. We're going to take bearing from number one, swap it with bearing number four. Now put those caps back in place and torque them again and get your new reading. Now by just simply finding the difference between the two sizes, we've gone from two thousandths to two three on bearing number one and two seven down to two four on bearing number four. We're not going to get any better than that. We're going to prep the bearings next, and we're using Torco assembly lube that we got from Metal Brock throughout this build. Which brings us to our crankshaft. Now it's a repurposed piece we've reused to try to save money, which is fine by me. It's a stroker crank from Eagle. It even stayed standards on the mains and rods. Now by not buying a new one or regrinding this one, we were able to afford the balance. And to keep it all together, we used ARP studs with some of their Ultra Torque assembly lube. Now here's something you can do at the house for free and make a big improvement in oil flow. Now this is where the oil pump feeds the engine and this wall can be a bit restricted, so we're going to fix that. Now you'll never notice the effects from this, but in the world of racing, every small improvement can equal big results. Since this rear main is also the thrust bearing, I won't torque it down yet, but I will torque one through four. Then apply forward pressure to the crankshaft. Now torque the rear main. This will lock the crankshaft in place, but you should always check your end plate, which needs to be between five and 10 thousandths. I'm happy with lucky number seven. Now minus machine work, the only new money we've got in this block right now is in camshaft, bearings, and studs. Let's hope our luck holds out for the rest of this project. We're back on our budget bracket motor, and so far, all I've got in is my crank and camshaft. You can't rush perfection. Now we're ready for our timing set. Now this one you might not be that familiar with, it's even a first for me. Now this one's Comp Cam's wet belt drive system. It's designed to go behind the timing chain cover, 
for racers who don't want it outside their block. Now the cam gear is built aluminum, the crank is steel, and the belt, they say, is stronger and more reliable than a chain. With a little Loctite anti-seize, it's a press fit, not hammer fit into place. Remember when I clocked the cam right after the install? Here's why. When you set the crank pulley correctly, the rest is pre-aligned. This will save a lot of hassle when installing the timing chain. Now we can't degree our camshaft until we get our number one piston and rod assembly together and in the motor. Now we're reusing these from our engine. They're a forged I-beam rod from Eagle rated at 500 horsepower just like our crankshaft. Now we're going to top them off with a set of Sportsman Series forged pistons from Probe. Now they're a flat top two valve relief piston that should put us right in the compression ratio of 11 to 1 that we're looking for. They have floating pins with high performance spiral locks, which simply means they won't fall out or go in easy. The rings from Total Seal are a Plasma Molly 1 16th, 1 16th, 3 16th package that need to be file fit. The oilers are fine, but the scrapers need help. We've been dying to use this ring filer from Goodson. With gauge adjustable guide, it takes the guesswork out of how much you're removing. I still take a little bit off at a time because you can't undo what you already did. The compression ring gets the same treatment. With the rings on and oiled, the cylinder's pre-lubed and number one in the hole, we can degree our cam to the cam card specs, 102 straight up. And with our remaining pistons in place, we can go ahead and torque them down. Only half of our timing cover goes on next. We need to first install the cam button without shims, which rides against the inside of our cover. Here's why we like this setup. It has a removable plug so that you can accurately set your in play with a dial gauge. By putting slight pressure on a lobe through the lifter bore, I can see where we're at. 50 thousandths is a long way from recommended 10 thousandths. Now here's how easy it is to correct it. I use calipers to get a stack of supplied shims right at 45 thousandths. Stack them behind the button and try it again. And that's where we need to be. To make sure it stays that way, I use Loctite on all the bolts and torque them down. The last part is the belt retainer. Do not forget it. I'm verifying top dead center to install our balancer. Now it's a TCI rattler with an external balance and a floating weight inside. It's noisy, but will give us that extra assurance on bearing life and absorb harmonics at higher RPM levels. After a thorough cleaning, we're gonna reuse our Mellings high volume oil pump. The rear main gets a new seal, the block gets some silicone, and a one-piece reusable oil pan gasket from Felpro. Since the oil pan and pickup are a pair, with a little black paint, they're reunited. At this point, our short block is done, but we're not done yet. We're back on our budget build, and we picked up the pace a little bit. We've got the short block done. Now we're gonna be reusing a set of Edelbrock Performer RPM cylinder heads that was on our motor last time. Now they didn't have a lot of runtime on them, so all I had to do was some cleanup work. The first thing I did was CC and mill the deck surface so I could set them where I wanted them. Then I cleaned up the throat area with a cartridge roll, and as you can tell by the red dicom left over, I've already lapped in all our valves. Now since we didn't need a valve job, we put our money in the springs. We upgraded these Beehive springs from Comp. Now they take a little less spring pressure, but they stay just as stable. Our spring height is correct. The problem is, the spring's gonna walk around while we run the motor. Now we're gonna fix that by running a locator. Now when we do that, we're gonna lose 50 thousandths on our install height. Now we've got a couple of options. You can machine the spring pad, do a valve job to sink the valve, or you can buy a whole new set of springs. But we're gonna do this. Now this one's the standard lock that I use to check our install height. See how high the lock is? Now these from Comp will actually lower the lock, but raise our install height 50 thousandths. I like to put a little oil in the guides as well as some grease on the valves themselves. That way you guarantee they're lubed during fire up. Now these valves also got bee blasted and faced, but just as important, I numbered them to ensure they went back in the same hole they were lapped in at. With our locators located, we can install our seals, springs and retainers, followed by our new corrected locks. With a little more silicone, on goes our multi-layered steel head gaskets from Kometic. Now on this block, we don't have blind bolt holes, so a round of sealing is in order. These gaskets need a couple of torque steps to compress all the layers. 
40, 55, and finally 65 foot-pounds. These are our new lifters from Comp. Now because this is a racing engine, I went with a retrofit lifter that's held together with a vertical tie bar. Now racers have been using these for years, and sometimes it's just as well to go with what you know is going to work good. Since we're upgrading the rockers, I'm doing the same with these 7 16 studs from ARP. Here's something I learned from an old timer a couple years ago. Did you see that? The guide plate moves when you torque it. Something as small as this can put you back in the trailer fast. Now here's how you fix it. All it takes is a screwdriver and some slight pressure to hold the guide plate still while you're torquing. I pre-measured for push rods at the machine shop. And since it's a racing application, I ordered Comp's high-tech version. These stout 5 16 push rods will do the job. We also upgraded to these new Ultra Pro Magnum rocker arms. They have a hardened roller tip, oversized roller trunnions, and precision sorted needle bearings. Now these are also great for racing because you can rebuild them. Plus, comp backs them with a lifetime warranty. I like to lash them one at a time after it goes on. That way there's no chance of accidentally forgetting to lash one. Now's a good time to fill that pan with some braking oil from Edelbrock. It's also good for engines before you switch to a synthetic oil. I've been told I go a little overboard with my silicone. I even put a little bit on both sides of my Mr. Gasket. Then, I make my Caterpillar. And we're finally ready for the intake. And we're reusing the old one, but with a difference. We've powder coated it. Now it makes no difference in the racing world, so why do we do it? Because we can. Now the truth is, the powder coating's not just for looks. Raw aluminum absorbs oil, and a slick finish like this cleans up with a little Windex. And if you like it, you could probably get it done in your town for around 50 bucks. Don't forget to apply silicone to all the bolts not going into blind holes. Now we're also going to reuse these valve covers, bolt on a dyno dedicated electric water pump, and finally move the motor over to the dyno cart. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry. John's getting anxious. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Slow down. When you get this way, we make mistakes. Relax, it'll all happen. You're watching Horsepower. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Horsepower collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. It's payoff time for John's budget bracket motor. I'm ready to prime right now if you are. Now he should be proud. I watched him build it. It's solid and it's tight. What was the bore on this? 430. But when it comes to the dyno room, John's uh, confidence three, throws a rod. Three, uh, 3750, I'm sorry, 3750. His track record is spotless, but he's a perfectionist and doesn't want to let anyone down. Go ahead, John. And me, I'm sick in the head. I kind of enjoy the show. Is that? It's holding 70. Okay. Now the MSD distributor, and the Holley 750 carb are both from the original build of the engine. That means they were both tuned for it as well. Let's see how close they are. Oh, Hold your hands up. You're nervous as hell, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, oh God, yeah. Why? Oh, man, it's make or break for me, man. No, you, I mean. I'm, I'm you okay with it. with the way it went together? Yeah, hell yeah, I'm stoked. I don't, it's not the It went problem. together good. I don't know of anything else I could have done in preparation to make it any better, but. Change that nervousness to confidence. All right. I'm good. They always run pretty good. All right, you ready? Yeah, I'm good. Oh! Whoo! <laughs> you get lit? Yeah. Like a swift kick in the privates. <laughs> <laughs> I'm awake, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, ready? Too much fuel. Damn, this is number two that just blowing out the Venturi. So is John. With time, we could tune it, but we'll swap it for a new one. I think it was dumping enough fuel to be a pro mod. Now that's the sound John needed to hear. But these painted headers we found need time to cook a little. He sprayed it with 500 oh, degree paint. Okay. We a little above that already. Despite the carb swap, and the smoke, we're almost there. Almost. You can actually hear the hesitation, and here's why. 
The springs are heavy for a slow timing advance, so we need to swap them out for lighter ones. Finally, we can break it in, bake off some paint, like and see what John's torque. expecting. I like my torque to be just as high as my horsepower within, you know, 10, 20 horsepower. I'd be stoked with 460 to 470. You can tell by the sound this thing's starving for fuel. We'll up the jets and the squirters. All right, let's see what we got. That feels dead on. Cool. So as I stumble down low, we can get that out with time in 462, 461. The horsepower and torque are hand in hand, just like John wanted. We know there's more in here. We'll try three more degrees of timing. It wants more air, exactly what it is. With some longer studs and an HVH one inch spacer, that's exactly what it will get. Let's do it. Still nervous? No, I'm good now. That leg's moving I think off. We'll be all right, yeah. <laughs> all right, here we go. Man, that thing's crisp. It sounds good. It likes to climb too. That's your 470. 471. 471, 457. That torque number has been within two foot pounds on every single pull. Yes, since we started. Every single pull. You want to see if it'll pull 10,000? No. <laughs> no. There it is. I mean, that's solid. Sweet. Can't do anything different there. Good job on the first one. Thanks, man. Cool. Well, John's happy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We all got entertained. Oh! Whoo! And now we have an excuse to build a bracket car. <laughs> you get lit? Nice.